This is a, uh, a panel that uh, I'm very excited about hosting. It's about uh, personalizing media experiences. And we have three expert panelists here who are part of the MediaX community. Uh, right here on my right is Robert Seliger. He comes for, to us from uh, BitTubes, which is a project out of the Fraunhofer Institute. Next to Robert is Anhoa Trong, who is a Knight Journalism Fellow. and bringing up the end there, but not last in our minds, is Mark Kasson, who is uh, a, a uh, curriculum evangelist at Bluescape. So I want to start the panel by uh, letting each of uh, our panelists explain a little bit about what they are and what their projects are that they're working on. And we'll start with uh, Mark, since you're the closest. Oh, great. Thank you. You're welcome. And I want to thank again Martha, MediaX, Jason, everybody on the team for having us have this opportunity to kind of speak to you about Bluescape. Um, in a nutshell, Bluescape is a visual collaborative platform that works well in any environment. The difference is that it's persistent, real-time, and cloud-based. So basically, you're in an environment where you can communicate with each other on all different kinds of levels using all kinds of different devices. Uh, what I'm going to do is actually show you a quick video of what Bluescape is. Let me start with that. Bluescape is a virtual collaboration platform which is persistent, real-time, and cloud-based. Individuals and teams create and collaborate from anywhere and anytime around visual content using an ecosystem of devices, a tablet, a smartphone, a personal computer, or configurable multi-touch monitor to an entire wall. The foundation of Bluescape is the workspace, a vast virtual canvas. You can add templates, note cards, images, files, websites, videos, drawings. Everything you and your team needs to work. Invite others to collaborate by email with you and your team in the workspace. Your guests may view, contribute, or just follow along. So how do you use Bluescape? You can design, develop, work, and review all in real time. Agile development without moving, erasing, or losing content. You can do mind mapping with no limits. Create interactive presentations never seen before and capture the entire evolution of a project in a single view. Easily work with remote teams in different time zones. Think of the exciting possibilities to work in a brand new way. So what happens is with Bluescape is it provides a, because of the persistence, it allows you to accelerate any decision making process and work together in a collaborative environment. So you can drive better de decision making, you can have all kinds of uh, opportunities to create all different kinds of environments. I really want to talk about the environments really quickly because what's important is that we've been able to take the, the chains off of graphic designers and people who create content because we are no longer kept in an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper world. You can create any kind of image that you would like up to 60 uh, square uh, feet in any type of version you'd like, using the wall or using uh, your laptop or any other device. In the future, people will be just using their phones to add content and writing into the workspaces, and they'll be able to uh, create all kinds of content. So this idea that the gamification of content through HTML5 content will be really impressive. Uh, what we've done is we've freed the graphic designer. They can create all kinds of learning management systems, testing, any type of thing that you'd like to do within that environment. And um, that would be one of the big keys to it. We've already had people who are creating testing for different car manufacturers, uh, different types of environments. Well, we'll really be able to really transform the way people work, and that's what we're really talking about. We're talking of behavioral change, a managing a world where you no longer are at your desk, you're no longer, um, you're actually standing up and communicating with people in a real collaborative environment that's persistent and again in real time and that makes a huge difference. So it really does connect people across different environments, uh, different types of aspects. Um, you're able to uh, have video conferencing with people if you'd like or not like. You have the choice to do that. I'm thinking of what Larry was talking about, about how we want to get the devices and the robotics out of the way. 
I think Bluescape has done a really good job at that. Basically, it's a wall where all you have to do is know how to write and how to move things, and that's it. That's basically all you have to do to use Bluescape. Now, in driving the content for education, entertainment, that's going to be a big difference there because we have already challenged major motion picture companies to how would you redesign the storyboarding content? How would you change the environment so that you would have all the things that you need collaboratively while making a movie, for instance, or creating curriculum in a class? You'd be able to do it that way. So Bluescape really is a way for people to connect and really transform the way you work. Awesome. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, on Hoa? <clears throat> Hi, my name is An Hua. I'm a John S. Knight uh, Fellow. So it's a program here in Stanford fostering journalism, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Uh, I'm a French, thank you very much. I'm a French journalist and uh, science and uh, with an expertise in science and technology. And um, well, I've always been passionate about emerging technologies and their potential applications uh, in the, for news media. Now, well, virtual reality is not, well, so virtual anymore. Uh, there's Oculus Rift, uh, Google Cardboard headset like this one, Steam Vive, the Sony Morpheus, and other competitors. And what's incredible with VR, with virtual reality, is that it's a very personal, very intimate experience. It's about immersion, it's about empathy, engagement, with the stories. And so that's just a powerful tool for journalism. And so as a science journalist, the question was, how could we journalists use this compelling media for, to tell science stories? And I call this field immersive science. So virtual reality headsets, you might know that, allow you to watch 360 degree videos. So it's a video where you can turn around and look and hear in every direction. And there's also real-time 3D graphics environments, just like in video games, where you can interact with your environment. Now, do you remember these movies? It's from the 80s and the 60s. The heroes were shrunk and injected uh, into a human body. Well, that's the kind of journey uh, we can offer with virtual reality. We could have users, so readers for newspapers or viewers for a TV broadcast, playing with cells, viruses, particles. It's a, an uh, sorry. It's a very powerful educational tool for science communication. Another application: wildlife documentaries. Uh, one of my upcoming projects is to shoot 360-degree video in natural preserves. For example, you might know the Ano Nuevo uh, State Park between Half Moon Bay and Santa Cruz. Well, it will be using 360 degree video, it will be like a virtual safari. Now, Stanford has an incredible virtual reality research center, as you may know, the Virtual Human Interaction Lab, led by Professor Jeremy Balenson. Well, one of the lab focus is to show how VR can make people feel more engaged with climate change. So I had an idea following the same mindset. If we saw the world the way a polar bear does, well, maybe we would uh, care more about climate change. So I worked on a rough prototype with uh, Capitola. It's an agency based in Netherlands, in the Netherlands. Um, it's just a mock-up version, but as you can see, the simulation is a virtual reality minigame where the player experiences life as a polar bear. He has to go from one sea ice uh, block from an, another in order to seek his food, uh, its food, sorry, uh, seals. But as the ice melts year after year, well, it's more and more difficult to, to find food. And, in, in the, uh, and when comes the year 2050, well, there's no ice anymore, so, well, it's game over. For another project, I also thought about the impact of climate change on famous places that like, people all know. 
Here, the Waikiki Beach in Hawaii. Well, in the year 2050, this place could become a flooded field of rocks because of sea level rise and sand erosion. So what if we could leave these changes in a VR simulation? It could be a mix of 360 degree video and a 3D environment. You could travel in time. So as I'm exploring, as I explore right now the field of VR and uh, I experiment with the technology and work on prototypes, I see how virtual reality is a unique opportunity for us journalists to think differently about how information can be presented. VR gives us new tools for creative storytelling. It could be used by news companies, museums, schools, science labs. And well, I'd be happy to show you some videos of it uh, during the lunch uh, exhibit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anho. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> are, you t are you telling me my beach in Hawaii is going to be rocks? Oh, yeah. <laughs> If we, don't, if we do nothing about it, oh. yeah. So the uh, idea of this panel, of course, is to uh, talk about changing media landscapes, how content's created, curated, and consumed. And uh, Robert's working on a project here that uh, covers all three of those issues. Robert, please. Got it. Yeah, um, first of all, also for me, um, Big thanks to Martha and the whole MediaX team for having the opportunity to speak to, to you here. Um, yeah, as Jason introduced, we are working on interactive video content. So as you all know, the traditional video content is something that has been produced before, and then people can start to yeah, watch the video in a linear way. There is no really further way to interact with the content besides, of course, all the emotions that are in the video and all the things that the people that have created it um, thought about before. But what about adding a new layer on, on top of the video that um, allows people to really interact and personally engage with the content itself? And yeah, this is what we uh, started to work about now since three or four years ago at the Fraunhofer Research Institute. And we made out of this the, the BitUbes technology platform that really helps to add interactive items on video content that has been produced already for every people out there. So um, this is basically also what the picture here shows. Um, we try to, or we already managed to um, add an additional layer on top of the video content that lets you, as a user, really interact with specific items in the video. So in this case, for instance, you can click on the Brandenburger Gate within the video just with your fingertips to receive additional information about that. You can um, have some kind of um, non-linear storytelling within a video where you can really decide beforehand that there are specific objects where people can then choose whether they want to go direction A, B, or C. And there are also a lot of other um, yeah, possibilities for um, additional use cases that I want to just guide you through during the next minutes to show what all this is about. Um, yeah, this maybe we can start from the perspective of the user because this is what we really started to think about when we uh, created the technology. It was what can the user do with video content that has more than just a linear story? What about adding? Um, different items and in this case you can see one of the first example players that we built and that we validated and tested during the last years across all the different platforms so there's also the content creation you have to be uh, you need to do it once and you can distribute this interactive type of video content across all the different platforms on your smartphones on your tablets on your smart TV wherever you want to go and um, as you can see here this is the traditional web player and as soon as you for instance here click on this bus, which of course moves through the scene, um, you can receive additional information. You can really also engage with our social communities. You can share specific parts of video content on your social networks. And you can, of course, attach any kind of supplemental information that is available in this beauty world of the World Wide Web. Um, yeah, just to give you a clue what uh, this could look like. So what about um, having the records of this conference are uh, being um, on demand available afterwards and um, all the things that we are talking about here, 
all the presentations that have been made, all the flyers, all the communication that took place here can be inserted in their video for all the people that were not able to attend but want to experience the whole, let's say, yeah, the, the whole expectation and the whole um, communication that took place here. And in this case, this is something we did together with MediaX um, last year. Um, this was another conference and we created the videos um, based on the um, interactive video platform. And you were really able to receive additional information about the speakers. You are directly linked to all the background information about the projects and the ongoing research work that took place and that people talked about. And yeah, that's really fine. Um, just give you another example. This is something that we did together with a German newspaper when um, the US president um, visited Berlin last time. And um, yeah, the idea here was to provide an, a transcript that lets you, as a user, really engage with the speech. So we had it in English. There were also a German live translation ongoing on the website. And you had the opportunity to really dive into the topics that you are interested in by just clicking there. And our video technology helps to find the appropriate position in the video. And again, links all the related information that is available for this specific topic. There are, of course, some more like the traditional advertising stuff. There is one we already launched in Germany, which is about travel booking. So you are able to have a helicopter view of your um, um, vacation area. And then we use our technology to place some kind of text or labels on top of the hotels and give you all the real-time information about the current um, vacancies, the pricing, the recommendations from users, and all of that. But these are just some examples. Uh, my colleague Jürgen will show some more also video content stuff that we created in the, in the Hive presentations during the lunch. And I think that's all for now. And yeah, we can continue with the Excellent. other stuff. <clears throat> <clears throat> Thank you. Um, this is one of those panels, and as you guys all know, and I, I have to do this uh, on, oh, can I try these on? I've been dying to try these on since you put these up here. Oh, you have to look a uh, smartphone on it. Oh, no, don't they work like this? <laughs> yeah, but. Oh, you guys look amazing. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. You're all right here. Thanks. So uh, obviously, it's an instant gratification. What have you done for me lately, world that we live in? You know, it's give it to me now, give it to me fast, give it to me the way I want it. So how do you look at and envision each of your uh, platforms, the things that you're working on? How do you guys address that issue of now, now, better, better, stronger, faster, that uh, people are want? Mark? Sure. Um, with Bluescape, since it is a collaborative workspace, everything is contained in there. So you get to instantly gratificate yourself by uploading the content and then be instantly in the same space as everyone else. So in that sense, we, I think we do a really good job of that. Excellent. Robert? Yeah, so from, from our, um, yeah, our, our platform, how we created it, so we already tried to use just open standards. There is nothing that you need in specific of a particular kind of software. It's everything browser-based. You can upload your content that is, has been created before for other purposes. You can create your specific stuff. Just upload it there. Use the, the tagging uh, software that we created on what any kind of device you currently have at your fingertips, and then just yeah, adding additional information. So that's really what we are looking for, to do it just once and then distribute it all over the different um, devices. Mark? Including Bluescape. Actually tested bit tubes and it works fantastic. So Thank you. You, you, you get on it and it gives you all the information. So it works. Well. Yeah. By the way, that uh, Jeremy Balinson video that I think you guys can see in the Hive Man. Whoever did that was really good. Just saying. Yeah. Just saying. <laughs> yeah. It's it's good. Too. Just saying. That's good. <clears throat> Ono. Oh. In the instant gratification world, like the things you're working on, how are you trying to? Uh, you know, tackle that issue of people wanting it now. Want it. I mean, you're talking about 360 environments, and is that something that you're yeah. looking to? Do? Well, the question now is how to uh, use that in newsrooms, how to integrate uh, this technology in our uh, workflow. Well, I'm a journalist. I, I don't usually build things, you know. Um, I'm using them. So now the way is to uh, convince first the newsrooms to, uh, to, to uh, use that. And for that, the question is, what stories are we telling 
with VR, we can't tell any kind of stories. We, it's, not, it's not because we have a new toy that we can do anything with it, you know? So the question is that how to make that practical? Because it's not, well, cheap sometimes, uh, especially for newsroom, as you know well. Uh, uh, the press market is not that, the press industry is not that in a good shape right now. So projects like 3D graphics environments uh, it cost between at least dozens of thousands of dollars to hundreds of thousands of dollars. For newsroom, that's just too much. So we have to make it count. We have to find perfect topics, perfect stories to fit with this technology and to have a really compelling uh, storytelling for that. What, what kind of stories do you see those being? Well, I think climate change is a good one, uh, especially because, uh, and especially this year, that's why I'm working on this this year, there's a, a conference in, in Paris, well, that's where I'm from, so. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, it might be the conference to change things. So if we could have people feeling more engaged, uh, using empathy, using, uh, yeah, playing, you know, like uh, game mechanisms and so on. Uh, we have to try. Excellent. Mark, going back to uh, Bluescape, where do you see that going as far as, is, uh, are you trying to change the project management side of things in the office? You're just trying to change the entire landscape inside of the office? Or what would you say the goal is for what you're currently working on? Well, the goal really is to transform the way people work. So it's really taking the whole notion of this collaborative work environment that Esther was talking about with kids and schools and having that more be the office kind of space. But the great thing about Bluescape is that it has this uh, viewport basically into limitless kinds of worlds where you can create different projects. So project management is in there, story of any type of ideation or creation, anything like that will be effective. And uh, can you show real quickly, uh, maybe demonstrate how it would look if you're trying to use stuff on the wall in the imaginary space that is the Bluescape environment? Sure, so basically you'd come up to the wall, you'd take your phone out and you'd punch in a five digit code and then your workspace would load. And this would be like opening up a, a document in any kind of computer program. But think of it as a virtual world where you can actually enter into it. And then from there, you'd be able to create content, add content that from your laptop computer, anything from the web. Uh, uh, that's why the whole idea of HTML5 developers creating games and any kind of gamification, any type of thing that you're trying to accomplish, anything that you can do on your computer or laptop, you can do basically in Bluescape. And uh, so essentially you, you have a stylus and you go up on the wall and you start writing on it. Now everybody would see who was in that specific workspace exactly what you're doing. And they would be able to contribute that way as well with note cards and pictures and anything for reference work. If you found a website that was a perfect re resource for what you were talking about, you could put that into the timeline. Another example would be kind of like if, um, let's say there was an American history class and there was a timeline for the student inside the workspace. And uh, they would, you'd have all the, the definite dates and time periods, but now all the work is what you put on those. And now a student could contribute that. Because for the first time with Bluescape, the student, the administration, the teachers, and the parents are all on the same page. Storytelling, obviously, a big portion of trying to uh, get engagement and the idea of coming up with what you want to show the average consumer Robert, what, how do you guys uh, solve that? Do you guys actually, for your product, do you, or do you need to create a storyboard first when you're uh, trying to put videos together? Or how do you look at that? Yeah, um, yeah as you know, so video is always the big thing uh, out there in the, in the World Wide Web. And we think really by, by adding this additional layer, it will be um, much more bigger than it is today. And um, how do we try to uh, accomplish this is, um, yeah, really creating a software that helps people to easily add their ideas to their video story. So it, if you're looking for the traditional way how to do this, this is something that you, you have something in mind, you want to tell a story and you create your video and it really guides the viewer through the content itself and then there is of course something at the end that says, okay, I, I got some clue about what you want to tell me with the, with the story. But even if there are 
a, a lot of different people watching your content and they might have also um, different expectations and different say also level of understandings how they interact with your content on the on the emotional way and if you can start right from the beginning um, use these additional layers and these additional um, methods to help people really to engage with their content on their personal level and their really um, personal experience then it could be very good and um, yeah you really should start when you um, are doing interactive content think about all the opportunities you have all the let's say um, supplemental information and all the additional content that's out there all the social media stuff and the people are really used to um, all the things that people are used to use and used to do and if you create this at the beginning I think you can really make more out of your content excellent uh, Anhoa, obviously virtual reality is one of those things that has been coming to your living room for a very, very long time. When's it going to come to our living room? Because well, uh, I'm ready. No, I'm ready. <laughs> is everyone ready for virtual reality to come to the living room? Of course. All right. Wait, there already did, it's all fact, up to you. Well, first, so whatever uh, you, you say here, we're going to take and yeah, go right. print. Because you're the journalist, too. So you have, yeah, you have a lot of options. Uh, for now, the, the cheapest option is a, a Google Cardboard headset, of, of course. Uh, and well, the Oculus Rift, uh, the consumer version, is due uh, maybe this year, maybe next year, we don't know, but well, soon. Uh, <laughs> soon. <a laughs> soon, coming soon, coming like, soon. No, but this year, I think that this year, um, uh, I mean, the end of this year, will be the, yeah, will be the VR time. Excellent. <laughs> a couple questions here for, <clears throat> excuse me, all three of you. We'll go with uh, Robert first. What's uh, one thing that you worry about that keeps you up at night? <laughs> there are different things. But besides Specifically with this particular topic. I'm really? sure there's all kinds of other things, but let's keep it on this panel. OK, if it's about this specific topic, I think there's one thing. If um, people are really blogging innovations and blogging new ideas, um, because of their, let's say, established businesses and their established way of thinking. I think this is the one thing that we should really break with and we should really start focusing on what we can do with the technology that's out there and which is already under development and not staying with something because it's still working. We should really focus on the future. Excellent. Mark, what keeps you up at night? I, I think uh, relative voice is it's adoption, it's behavioral change. I mean, it's always difficult to get people going from what they're used to doing and then trying something new and then having that be sustained. I think that's the biggest one. Uh, well, for me, I'm, I'm passionate about uh, science and journalism uh, as vital uh, um, fields for, for democracy and uh, and our societies. The thing is that I think we can do better with uh, science coverage in the news, um, especially because I, well, uh, maybe you heard about that, but there's a huge gap between what science labs do, science lab, their results, their studies, and what people believe. Like for climate change, for example, 90, uh, the stu uh, uh, a recent study said that 98% of the scientists believe in that it's caused by human activity. The adult public in the US, it's uh, something like 60%. Six, yeah, 60, sorry. Uh, it's the same for human evolution, like kind of the same uh, numbers. Uh, so to me, there's something to do with that. And yeah, the news are here for that. And the, what keeps me awake at night is how to use emerging technologies uh, for that, and especially because meanwhile, the generation of people between 15 and 35 years old, they are becoming the first news consumers, the first audience of news consumers. Uh, they are sometimes called millennials. I don't like this, this word, so just say this generation. And they grew up with digital medias and um, video games. So how to leverage, how to use these emerging technologies to engage this, this audience. That's, yeah, that's something that uh, I'm working on. Uh, and I think, and I'm convinced that VR and maybe later AR, augmented reality, uh, could be used yeah, for that. Excellent. What's one platform that you guys really enjoyed 
using that no longer exists? And what can you learn from that in the, in the studies that you're working on? Wow. Yeah, you first, Mark. <laughs> you said wow first, so you get to go first. <laughs> Painting. <laughs> I don't okay. Think, I don't think uh, I was actually talking. Uh, we actually had this uh, a media X event where there's this task-oriented mind that it's always in the way, and you have to find a way to quiet it down. And I was talking to some people who retired and basically said, you know, I've never been creative, I've never. But I've started to take an art class, and I'm really enjoying it. And I just feel like we don't give ourselves the time to be innovative and creative. And that's what I mean about the painting part. It's, it's almost a lost art. I mean, there are thousands of different size brushes when you paint it, and now there's just one or two different types. And so it makes a difference of how everything is created. So I think something like that along those lines is what I think. Robert, one platform that you enjoyed using that you doesn't exist anymore? Um, you learn from yeah, it? maybe the platform is not the right word for that. But there's, sure. for instance, there's Uber, the Uber stuff. The, they stopped it in Germany because of the taxi law. And this is something that I talked before. Don't stop new things because you're stuck in the old thinking about it. Uh, well, VR, as you know, is, uh, is not a new word. Uh, it was coined in the 1980s by um, Jaron Lanier. Uh, and and uh, in the 1990s, we thought it was going to be something. I, have, I had, I still have it. A virtual boy, which was you know like it was a, um, a gaming system, uh, like one kind of a success, uh, well not a success, but a cousin of the, the Game Boy, Nintendo Game Boy. It was Nintendo who created this uh, this headset. It was very heavy, quite well, kind of very awkward. You had to you had to put it on the table and, and you know and lean, and it was yeah it, it was not good. Well, really not. Um, so. Yeah, VR had, uh, had its uh, ups and downs, and what I learned, uh, what we learned from that, is that yeah, as the technology has to be mature, of course, to, to have a real immersive experience. And uh, I think it's, yeah, it's ready now. Excellent. Uh, I want to ask you guys on this last question to get out your crystal ball, so I hope you have them polished up. Obviously, you can't predict the future, but where do you see each of your projects being in two years from now? Where would you want them to be? Robert? Yeah, so I would really love to see that interactive content will really uh, be aware by every people out there. So that this is what videos today, interactive videos should be in two years. Mark? Um, it really, we've, we've thought long and hard on this and we really see that this technology is just gonna be, you know, perpetuate itself in every office space. You'll go into every single room. We actually have something called the nine rooms where you walk into a room and then you see the wall. And it, your workspace is like following you. So your work is with you and when you need it and when you want it. So you just walk into a room and that's it. So we're already seeing it with uh, all over with this ability to have this communication device that really works well. Let me guess, Arno. You want it to be in everyone's living room. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. And in every news coming soon. If it's in the every newsroom, if it's possible, well, and for that, what I'm trying to do, at least for the next month, is to have a, a portfolio of, of prototypes showing, like, the real potential of VR for um, science communication and journalism. Uh, for the years to come, uh, yeah, that would be to um, to have these VR uh, applications as a normal media, like as nothing new, as we use it that we use that as we could use uh, pictures, as we could use videos. We can use 360 videos to speak about this topic. We could have a VR game to speak about this topic. Um, and to add that in our set of tools to do a creative storytelling. Excellent. Well, please, thank me, please uh, join me in thanking uh, Robert, Anhoa, and Mark. They will also, all three, will be doing presentations during the lunchtime hour down in the Hive. And if you haven't seen the Hive, make a chance, go see it. It's an amazing, amazing display. And all these guys will be doing a great job down there, too. So thank you.